Hello, everyone, and welcome to this UK Data Service webinar on Hive. I'm Margarita, and I'm an outreach officer working for the UK Data Service in Manchester. And presenting with me today is Peter Smythe. He is a research associate uh, working for the UK Data Service too, and he's based in Manchester at the University of Manchester. I'll hand over to Peter, who is going to tell more about Hive. Thank you, Margarita. Um, before we get into this, I should point out that I have got a bit of a cough today, so if everything goes um, quiet, it means I've remembered to mute the mic before coughing. And if it becomes explosive, it means I've forgotten to mute the mic before coughing. Okay, so I apologise in advance. So, on with the webinar. Hopefully everyone can see the screen. Just listen to full screen. So what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to give a brief definition of what big data is and the problems that you can encounter working with big data. Then we'll introduce you to Hive and hopefully the majority of, the, of this webinar will go through some examples of using Hive to examine data and reduce the size of the data. And then when we've reduced the size, we'll um, show this new smaller data sets being used in, data, um, in desktop applications. So what is big data? Well, for the purpose of the webinar, we're going to use a, a standard definition from Wikipedia. Big data is a broad term for data set so large or complex that traditional data processing applications are inadequate. In practical terms, what that means is it won't fit into your desktop application. So if you're used to using Strata or SPSS or even R, it, it, it's just not going to fit. It's something which is too big by definition to fit into those applications. So how has it become too big? Well, if you look at the traditional sources of, of data, like, like surveys and census, this has been designed and collected specifically for research in mind, certainly surveys, less so at census. But again, the census data is typically broken down into different areas of, uh, of knowledge where, where people will typically want to do research in uh, on that in that area. So you can treat this a bit like survey data. So the point A is that this is data which has been collected purely, almost purely for researchers. But now we've got new data sources appearing. And these data sources come from social media, so you've got Facebook, Twitter, and various other ones. We've got sensor data lots of automobile type stuff, GPS type stuff, CCTV cameras, um, Fitbit, your heart monitoring stuff, um, and you've got virtually every application on your mobile phone probably uses data or to and fro from web servers and so on. And then we've got the transaction data, so we've got the traditional, um, well, I say traditional, the now now traditional way of shopping using eBay and Amazon and things like that where all of your click stream, every, every time you click the mouse, it's recording some data. It's not just recording the purchases you make, it's recording everything you look at and how you even move the mouse across the screen. Um, we've got um, all your bank cards where transactions at the tail are all being recorded and of course you've got online banking itself. All, the, all of these data sources produce vast, vast amounts of data. And what makes them a bit different um, from the traditional sources is that these haven't been collected primarily for the researchers. The companies which are collecting this or collecting the data and providing the means to collect this data are doing so for their own commercial purposes. Now, as a consequence of that, that they're collecting what they need to collect, not what you might want to use. And the effect is that the data, as it is collected, can be very verbose. And by verbose there, uh, I mean there's an awful lot in there that is being collected which isn't relevant or of any use to you as a researcher. And the problem with these data sets, if you have them available to you, is that you've got to take either the whole data set or leave it. So it will be down to you to reduce this data set in size and to extract the bits of the of data from it that you actually want to use. Now, to give you an example of this, um, let's, let's go through a little scenario where let's imagine um, that you're interested in 
Twitter data. Oops, seem to have lost that there. We're, we're interested in Twitter data, so we're going to look at tweets. Um, at the bottom of the view, we've got something like a log scale. It's just a, just a little guideline to give you an idea of how big and small these things are. So looking at the tweets, we have a sent tweet is very small, less than a kilobyte. But the actual data associated with the tweet can be several kilobytes in size, perhaps four or five. If you are interested in all the tweets from a user over a period of years, say, and Twitter's now just gone 10 years old, of course, you can have quite a lot of data involved. And if you're interested in analysing, say, the tweets from a user and all the friend, and friends of that user, did they retweet the tweets and so on and so forth, then we are talking about tens, could be talking about tens of gigabytes of data. If we look at this from the other point of view um, of, say, smart meter data, so this is a, a commercial energy company, say, collecting um, meter collecting usage of gas or electricity or whatever and, and storing it so across many many um, households and businesses all over the country you end up with a file which can be very large but as this is typically collected in half hour <laughs> intervals which isn't really much typically what you want to use we could aggregate that by day and that will reduce the size and then if we said well we don't need it by day, we can do it by month, we can reduce it further. And if we say, well, I'm only interested in, in a certain geographical area, then again, we can make it smaller. But the problem with all this is that if I was to draw an arbitrary line, let's say about five gigabytes, and, and suggest that anything below that line your desktop application can cope with, and you, you will happily continue using your desktop application, even if it perhaps gets a bit sluggish towards a larger end of this scale, um, then that, that, that's fine. But there gets to be a point where you, you end up having to use a big data environment because the data is simply too big. So anything in this re grey region here, if that's what you've got, and that's what you're being forced to start off with, then you, you need a big data environment to deal with that. And the one we're going to look at or use part of is Hadoop. So as I've just said, if, if your data set is big at the start, then you need a big data processing system to work with it. And, and Hadoop is the one for us because within Hadoop, we need to do two things. We needed to store our data sets. Now, in theory, storing big data sets isn't simply storing them isn't a problem because if you think about it, you can go out now to Amazon and get four terabyte disks to put on your NAS storage, just all your videos and what have you, and that's that's definitely in the big data scheme of things. The problem is having got it onto your disk, you, you can't do anything about it. You can't do anything with it. You can't load it into your desktop applications to process it. So we also need a way of processing our data sets. So storing um, data sets in Hadoop is almost transparent. Hadoop uses something called HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System. And what it does, um, I should point out, a Hadoop cluster itself can consist of hundreds or even thousands of computers all working together. And each one of those computers has its own disk file store, just like you have on your PC or on your laptop. So what HDFS does, it chops up your large data set and gives chunks of it to a whole load of these different processes. So you imagine your, your nice data set all chopped up into bits and distributed to the four winds almost. Well fortunately, low HDFS doing that, you don't need to care about this because to the end user, a file is a file, a file system is a file system, you're just going to use your files and you're going to put them in directories just like you do in Windows Explorer, which is good. Um, but processing the data, <laughs> data set in Hadoop, um, again, there are several options available to you. There's um, the likes of Spark, Tez, Tejo, which is, I think, quite a new one, um, Pig, and there's Hive, which are the more traditional ones. And today, we're just going to look at, at Hive in particular. Okay. So what is Hive? Again, 
if we use the actual definition from Apache.org, who actually distribute Hadoop and Hive and several of the other products as well that I listed before, um, the official definition is the Apache Hive data warehouse software facilitates facilitates querying and managing large data sets residing in distributed storage. Hive provides a mechanism to project structure onto this data um, and query the data using an SQL-like language called HiveQL. Now, what, what does that mean to us? All we need to know from that is Hive will make our files look like tables. We can use simple bits of code to take extract data items from the tables, i.e. make the data sets, data files look smaller. And that's pretty much what we're going to do in our demonstration today. Now, a bit of background to the actual demonstration. Um, the environment we're going to use is something called the Horton, Horton Works Sandbox. Horton Works is just a commercial company um, specializing in big data. And the, the, the sandbox is um, some software which is going to run on, your, on a PC or a laptop. And it will look like a, a, a Hadoop cluster. It has all of the functionality of a Hadoop cluster, just not the performance of a Hadoop cluster. But all the things that we need to use are all going to be in there. Um, the second thing we need to note is that because we're looking at Hive today, not HDFS and other things, um, we're assuming that actually getting your data sets into Hadoop has already been done. Now, for, um, for, for both the environment and, and the loading of the data, on the UK Data Service website, we will be putting up sets of instructions on how to get hold of the sandbox and install it on your PC, and how to get hold of the data and instructions needed to load that into HGFS so that it can be used in Hive. And hopefully they'll be there by the end of this week. The actual data we're going to use is some smart meter data. And that, again, that can be downloaded from UK Data Services with the search number in the in brackets there. Um, it actually consists of several data sets, but the ones we're going to be looking at are the geography and the gas readings data set. So the geography data that we're going to use, when you actually download it, is about one and a half megabytes in size. Now this, this is a small data set, there's no doubt about it. You can easily load this into Excel. And that's exactly what I did. I loaded it into Excel and I effectively chopped out a few of the um, columns in that data set, which I wasn't going to use. I, it fits into, into my desktop application, I'm going to use my desktop application. It's as simple as that. So the actual file that we're going to, we've uploaded into Hadoop is actually less than one megabyte. So a tiny, tiny little file for Hadoop purposes. The other file on, on the, the other file, the meter readings for, for gas is 6.8 gigabytes in size and has 246 million records in it. No way can I load that into, a desk, in, into, into Excel. So here, it's got to go straight into, into Hadoop, and any kind of processing or manipulation I'm going to have to do within the Hadoop environment, in our case, using Hive. So just to describe these files in a bit more detail, the geography file, this is our cut down file, it has columns, if you like, or, or fields. Um, one is called a non-ID, and this is, this is just a number which represents some household or other. It's also got a set of a acorn columns, um, which describe various demographic group groupings. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And the nut one and nut four are geographic um, type regions. So the nut one is quite large geographic areas of, of the UK. So these are the, this is the ACORN structure. So it's got six categories, 18 groups, 62 types. And you can see here the first one's affluent achievers. Lavish lifestyles is the first group. Exclusive enclaves is the first type, and so on and so forth. You can download the, the full document from, from, from uh, the internet. Just if you do a search on ACORN demographics, we'll would probably find it. If you do just do ACORN, you'll probably find out a lot of stuff about oak trees, so don't do that. Um, the nuts one... <laughs> Oops, sorry. 
the next one values are, I, I say, large areas of, of the UK broken down. So the, the UKC is the actual code which appears in the file and it represents the northeast of England and so on. Um, that, that's not actually a complete list because certainly in the file we've got some UKM values which uh, represent Scotland. And I imagine there's one for Wales as well, but they, they, there's none of them in the file. So looking at the readings file, this is the gas readings files, 246 million records of it. So again, we've got a non-ID, and that's exactly the same a non-ID as we had in the geography file, except for some strange reason it's spelled differently in this file. That's nothing we've done, that's just the way the file comes. The second field, advanced date time, is, is effectively a timestamp for when this particular half hour reading was taken. And, and we'll, we'll use that quite a lot to, to do the aggregations. The third column, HH, is the half hour period within the day. So that ranges between 0 to 47, 48 half hour periods in the day. We're not actually going to use that at all. So in, in a sense, that's an example of, of um, the verbosity of this file. I mean, I know it's just a, part, a tiny part of this, this particular file, but you, you can imagine that in another file, there might be loads and loads of columns which you've got to accept, but which you don't really need to use. Um, the last one, of course, the gas kilowatt hours is the, the recording of how much gas has been used in that time period. Um, and we'll, we'll obviously need that to do um, work at how much gas has been used on a daily or a monthly basis and so on. So, hopefully on with the demonstration now. Um, what we're going to do, these are the sort of steps we're going to take. We're going to create tables from the data sets, because that's what Hive does for us. We're going to explore missing values um, from the geography table, and we'll draw a little um, simple bar chart to just to show the diversity of, of how those groupings are, groupings work. Um, on the the read, gas readings we said, uh, gas readings file we're going to these are remember these are starting in half hour periods so we're going to aggregate them up to days and then to months and then finally we're just going to, from the months we're going to take all of the data for for the year 2009 just to make the graphing look more meaningful when we do that later on um, we're also going to from the daily gas file we're going to um, create a summary table which will contain the, the minimum, the average and the maximum gas usage for each individual household across the entire date range of the file. And finally, we're going to join the gas readings file and the geography file, because the gas readings file only has, is only going to tell us how much gas a household has used. Um, if we want to do any kind of meaningful analysis with that data, we need to know something about the circumstances of that household, and that's coming from the geography file. So we need to join them together if we are going to subsequently go on to do any kind of analysis. Um, we're not going to actually go that far today. What we're going to do is, in R, we are going to look at this join file and just draw some simple graphs. And in Excel, we're going to look at the summary data table um, and draw um, a scatter plot chart and investigate some outliers. And how we're going to get from Hive into our desktop applications, we're going to use something called ODBC. ODBC, Open Database Connector, it's another little piece of software um, you can you can download it from Hortonworks, you can download versions from Microsoft, it's always free, um, and it's used to connect um, typically databases which don't have their own um, GUI, graphical user interface, to some other application which is going to provide those facilities for us. So we're going to download the tables from Hadoop using ODBC into R and into Excel. So, um, for the actual demonstration, um, I'm going to show you. Um, for the demonstration, what we're going to do, we'll obviously be using Hive, but we're going to use Hive via a product called Zeppelin. Now, both Zeppelin and Hive are included in the Hortonworks sandbox, so they're already there for you when you um, set up this sandbox environment. 
And then obviously for the last two parts, I've just said we would go out to the desktop and use R and Excel and connect um, to have using ODBC connector. Okay, demo time. So starting with the whole, oh, actually before I even get there, let me just show you when you actually load your um, sandbox up, in, in my case, I'm using um, VMware's workstation. Um, Oracle's VM virtual box is another option. But either way, when you finish loading up your VM, you'll end up with a nice black and white screen looking very similar to this. And the only relevant part of it that you want is this reading this address off here. And the reason you want, you want that address is that is the address you're going to put into your browser. Um, I'm using Internet Explorer, um, Firefox, Chrome, they'll both work. So I've, when you put that address into, into the browser, this is the initial page that comes up. And what we want to do is click on the advanced options there, and down at the bottom we have Zeppelin. And again, it gives you a separate um, IP address for Zeppelin, but it's, it's also a link, so you can actually just click on it and it'll take you into Zeppelin. And this is what Zeppelin looks like. And the way Zeppelin works is that it, it allows you to create what's called notebooks. So if I go to notebook here and say create a new note, it, it gives you some silly name to start off with, um, which I'm not going to bother changing. You can change it to what you want. You say create note, and nothing appears to happen. And the reason nothing happens is because it low creates a note, it doesn't actually load a note. So if you go back into notebook now, you can see <laughs> down here. If I click on it now, uh, I get this. Now this is a, an empty note. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a, a very simple query. Now, because Zeppelin is um, a general purpose tool, you can run other types of environments in there. In order to tell it that I'm going to run Hive, I've got to type in Hive first. And then I can type in a standard Hive QL type query. Let's start from sample 07. Now what this says, sample, uh, I'm saying select all of the columns from table sample 07, which is a, a default one provided with the sandbox. It doesn't have any useful information in it. And the limit 12 says just return the first 12 rows. And then if I was to run this, this little button down here, it will come back with the results of that query for the first 12 rows. Now. So the, the notebook is split into three parts. You get the at the top is where you write your query. At the bottom is where the results are shown for you. And in the middle, after you've got some results, you get a little um, toolbar here. Um, the first the item on the left is just show um, a table, which is the default. As you can see, we've got a table coming up here. But you can also change it to show simple little graphs. Um, not necessarily always particularly useful graphs, but little graphs of something or virtually nothing. You can change the settings to change it. So if I was to oops, go back here, get rid of that and put salary in there, then you can get a little bar chart like that. So very simple um, visualizations. I should point out that these visualizations are part of Zeppelin, they're not actually part of Hive as such. But we will be using this for, for our little notebooks later on. Um, so that, that, just a brief overview of how Zeppelin's going to work. So now we want to go into the, the our own Hive notebooks, which I've created previously to do the work the various steps in our present in our demo today. So the first thing we're going to do is make Hive think our data sets or tables. And the way we do that is we create what's called an external table, we give it a name geography, we list all of the um, various columns that are needed in that table and these represent the columns which are actually in the file. 
we need to tell Hive that each of these columns are separated by commas. We need to tell Hive exactly where this file is located. And in this particular case, we need to tell Hive that this, the file actually has a, its own header row, which you need to ignore. Okay, so all we're really doing is we're, we're tell, giving Hive a representation of our table and letting Hive, so Hive, when it needs to process a table, knows how to actually find everything and, and treat your data set as a table, which is what we want to do. So that's the geography table. It's exactly the same process for the, or the gas table here. Here I'm using um, the location of the, the gas data set is in user slash hive slash energy. It's only got the four variables as we discussed before. They're all separate by commas and again ignore the header row. Now when you actually run this query, I won't, I won't do it because I've already created these tables, but you can see at the bottom here, took one second, took one second. Now I've already told you that there's 246 million rows in this in this gas table. So to, re to create this in a second or a few seconds seems pretty impressive. But the reality is that all, all Hive's actually doing is making it's like a mental note of how this data set has to be processed when you do proper work against it. It's not reading in 246 million rows of data. It's just associating this description with the files in that folder. Okay. So moving on, we've created our tables. The next thing we wanted to do was look at the, the geography file. And so up here, what we're going to look at are the ACORN um, classifications. And uh, we're going to what we want to do is for each value occurring it under the ACORN category column, we want to know how often it occurs and what the value is. So if we run this, what we end up with is a little table here. So if you remember, there's supposedly six categories, one to six, which is certainly the bulk of our data here. But for some reason, we've got nine, which have a category of zero, which doesn't make sense. And we've got one, which is null, which again, doesn't make sense. So you can use this, this simple technique here to decide um, if you've got um, null values, missing values, or so on, or you get, or perhaps nonsensical values, things that you weren't expecting, as say. And we can do similar, exactly similar queries with all of these other variables in um, the geography table. So the next one down is, I'm doing exactly the same, but here I'm using the group, ACORN group. The rest of the, the queries is exactly the same. What I'm showing down here, though, instead of showing the table, which is goes from A to Q, I think, if we graph that as a, a a, a, as a little bar chart, then you can get a feel for how well represented each of these various um, um, groups are. So there's, there's clearly A, B, and C are well represented, um, H and I are, but there's, there's vast differences between, say, A and D, which is something that you may need to be aware of when you're considering what analysis to do. And again, that's just exactly the same on, this is on the uh, ACORN type, where you've got far more groups to worry about. And then we do exactly the same thing on the NUTS4 count. So this is a table, and there's quite a few, um, this is quite um, small geography. I, I don't know exactly what they represent in terms of size, but there's quite a few of them. Um, and again, all spread out. Um, if we do that for the NUTS1, where there's only uh, that handful of um, descriptions, UKD, F, and what have you. Again, you can see there's a vast difference between the nuts, how many values of UKF we've got in the file, as opposed to um, UKD. And at the end here, we've got UKM, which was missing from our description table. That, I'm pretty, that, that I know is, is actually representing the whole of Scotland. Okay, back to our other <laughs> query. So that, that's the, the geography file I looked at. We're now going to um, start doing our aggregations of the um, of the, the, the gas readings file. Um, just before we do that, just to confirm what I was saying before, if we run this query here, select count star from all gas, it will tell us how many records are in the file, 246,482,700. As we go down this file, this, this little notebook that we have, 
um, that's just a listing of the first five records in that file. So you can see here on the um, advanced date time, you can see the format of this. It starts with day, day, month, 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 um, year, year, a colon, and then a time in half hour periods. Obviously, they're all just eight o'clock. Um, and moving down, so the first thing we want to do is aggregate the, the, this file into days. And this is the code we're going to use to do this. Um, we're going to call a table gas days. We're going to use a, what's called a substring of the advanced date and time field. Now, a substring is a function, and it, it's the same function as you, you'd find in Excel. So I'm taking the advanced date time field and I'm saying start at position one and take the first seven. And if you remember what we've just seen, that's effectively the date part of that. So that's the date. I'm just going to chop off the time at the end. I want to sum the gas kilowatt hours because that. Each half hour represents the, the, the gas used in that period, so to get a daily reading, I need to sum them all together. And at the same time, I'm going to keep a, tra a track of how many readings, how many rows in the file are actually being associated with this um, aggregation. And the aggregation is going to be done on a non ID, so the household. So um, on the household and the advanced day time field. So what I'm going to end up with is a, a table which for each household on each day for which there are records, it will show me the sum of the gas used and how many readings there were associated with that day. Now simply running that, um, um, if I look at how many records I've got in my gas days file, I've got five, just over five million. I've already reduced it quite considerably. Um, and I can look at the first few records in the, in the gas days. And so this is for household number one. These are various days for household number one. These aren't necessarily in, in any order. There may be lots of other dates for gas for household number one in the file later on. We've got the total gas used and the number of readings. So 48 is what we would expect to see, there being 48 half hours in a day. But if, if I now run um, another query which asks how often each of these um, count readings occur in the file, and so this is very similar to what we're doing with the geography file, and graph that, we can certainly see at the end here we've got four, just over 4 million with 48, we've got nearly a million and 47. And almost everything in between has some little value in there. So these, these, anything not 48 represents a day for which there are readings missing. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, drop that table. Uh, what we're going to do, delete that table and start again. And the way you delete a table in Hive is you just say drop table and then give it a table name and it deletes it for you. Notice I'm deleting, what I'm really deleting is, well, in this case, I'm deleting the whole of the gas days table. If I had done that for all gas, all I'd be deleting would be the description. I wouldn't be deleting the original data for, for all gas, the, the, the readings data. Okay, so then I'm, all I'm going to do is recreate the table with this query here. And this is exactly the same query as we had before, except that I've added this line here. And that line means I only want you to put into the, to the resulting table um, records where the count of readings equals 48, i.e. I've got a full day's worth of readings in there. Um, moving on, so now I've got the 4,173,000 and they're the first five, which is redundant because it's exactly the first same five as we had before. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is combine this into months. So the format of that query is exactly the same, except I'm using a different substring. Because now, I'm pick, instead of picking out the whole date, I'm just picking out the month part of the date. And again, I ran the query to, to see, well, what, how many days in a month have we got all the way down here? And so lots of 31s and 30s, as you expect. We've got lots of a fair number of 29 because the, the range includes a leap year and 28. But again, you can see there are lots of records um, which don't seem to be have be for complete months. So you may want to get rid of them depending on what you're doing. In this case, we're just going to leave them in just for sure with that. Um, but we are now down to 148,893 records.
Um, the next query I'm going to run uh, show you is just creating the gas month of nine table and this is going to take what we had before the gas months but I'm only interested in um, the year 09 on the end so to get another just variation on the substring to select the 09. I'm now down to 70,106 records and and that's what the first few look like. So you can see that immediately that first record only has 26 readings, so it's not a full month's worth there. Okay. Um, and the other query which we need, is we need to create our summary table, which we're going to use later on. And you can see here, create, we're creating a new table. We've got a minimum, we want the average, and the max. These are all sans built-in functions, just again, just like as you'd find it in, in Excel. We're giving them new names so that they look nice in the table, and, and we're just sorting them and grouping them, again, by the non-ID. So for each non-ID household, there will be one record with a min, an average, and a max of the gas usage on a daily basis across the entire um, time frame of, of the data set. And then you can see what some of them look like down there. Okay. Now the next thing we want to do is do our join of the table, and this is the the code which does the, the query which does the join. And I'm just going to switch back now to the um, I want to describe the, the, that join process in a bit more detail. So we'll go back to the slides for a minute. Um, other than that. Um, these are just a couple of slides explaining the Zeppelin, but we have described that in the in the demo there, so we don't need to go through them. So joining the tables. We've got two tables that we're interested in. We've got the geography table, which is the original geography table, and the one that we've just created, gas month so nine. Now if you've got to join tables, they've got to have one column which is common to both. In our case, we've got a non-ID on the geography and a non-underscore ID on the gas months nine. Now, despite the names, we know they're the same thing, so that doesn't make any difference to us. Um, in the geography table, the non-ID occurs once and once only for each record for each household because it's just a single record describing. Um, the geography and demographic of, of that particular household. On the gas month so nine table, however, we're actually going to have, typically we're going to have 12 rows of data for each non-ID because there's 12 months in the year 2009 and there should be one row for each one. It's not guaranteed because you don't know what data is missing, but that's, that's what you'd expect. Uh, and so again, this is a, the full breakdown of, of the uh, listing of that query. So. We're creating a table, we're going to call it gas 9 geography. This section here is a list of all of the fields that we want from both tables now. So the ones prefixed with A are coming from um, from, <laughs> from the gas months of 9 table and those with B come from the geography table. Um, using these uh, what are called aliases or, or new names for geography in gas months of 9 is just a, a convenient shorthand for, for um, prefixing the the column name, so you know what you know what table they've come from, and also in a lot of cases, um, if you're joining tables, you're joining them on a field where the name is actually the same field name, so you do need some way of distinguishing them. Um, so on the, on the last line here, where we've got on B a non-ID equals A a non-ID. If, if non-ID had been written the same in both cases, we would need the, the A and the B to distinguish which one we were talking about. And when we've um, run that join, what we end up with is a single table, gas 09 jog table, and in there, on, on the left-hand side, we've got the columns which came from the um, gas 09, uh, gas months and on the other side we've got the columns which came from the geography table. Okay so um, we're now ready to look at the last part of the demonstration which involves using R and Excel and we'll start with the R. <laughs> What I've got here in R Studio is just a little script of R. I've run the first part because it's just setting things up. The first line that we're, we're really interested in here is this line here, 
where I'm going to make uh, use my ODCB connector to connect to R. And when I run that, I just get a, a little variable up here called channel, and it, you can't really look at that. It's just telling me that it, it's got a connection. This is really the important one, because here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a query across my ODBC connector to effectively select all of the rows from the GAS09 geography table, and I'm going to return them to the data frame called DT1. If I run that, after a few seconds, I can see I've got DT1 up here, and I've got 7,106 columns in it, uh, rows in it, I beg your pardon, which is what we saw before um, on, on, the, <laughs> on the gas months table. Okay, um, <laughs> just a little bit of housekeeping down here. Um, I'm just going to copy the, the, the data, um, data frame before I play with it. I'm going to do a bit of manipulation here to actually include in the data frame, this new data frame, a properly formatted date um, variable, because I need that to do the graphing. And then I'm also going to do an aggregation into DTA um, so that I can draw graphs based on the nuts one value. So you can see here, my DT copy it's the same number of observations as DT1, except I've got this extra variable on the end, which is a date called date, and then that's what it represents. So now I'm going to do my graphs. So the first graph I'm going to show is a line graph of nut one. And here you can see um, it doesn't really tell you much because we haven't taken into account the number of um, records, if you like, relating to each of these nut one categories. But what it does clearly show, and which we already knew, was that people use less gas in summer than they do in winter. Okay, um, and the second graph is, is a bit similar, but this time we're going to use the um, acorn ca categories. Um, um, of which there's only, oops, of which there's only six. Or suppose you're in six. And again, you get nice little stacked chart again, <laughs> really just telling exactly the same thing. You use less gas in summer than you do in winter. So that's it for R. So moving on to our Excel system. Um, what I've got here is I've just opened an Excel spreadsheet. There's nothing in, in here at the moment. Um, I'm going to go to, oops, to data and say from other sources Microsoft query and here I'm going to pick my sample Hortonworks Hive DSN which is my ODPC connector. If I click OK there it asks me for a password. I'm going to put in, I can test it and that tests OK. As soon as I say OK it will go to Hive and get a list of, of tables for me. And the table we want to use is this gas days summary table that we created, especially for this purpose. I'm going to select that. I want all of the columns. Uh, I'm okay with everything else. I'll just default everything to finish. Where do you want to put the data? Ooh, not there. Start in the corner up there. And it will now go to Hive, get the d data from that table, and it will download it and put it into, into here. Let me just... Um, uh, now, what I want to do is, from there, I want to draw a tape, a, a, a graph. Um, in this case, a scatter. Oops, a scatter graph. Um, this is actually only available in Excel 2016, I believe. But never mind. I make that a bit bigger. So, you, oops, so you can see it. You will immediately see at the top here. I've clearly got a rogue outlier here. 11840, 22,120. And if I was to uh, go back to my table and sort it, you can see that coming up to the top. Okay, so you can, and there's a few of these here which might be look a bit suspicious as well. And just, just finally, what I did, I did this earlier, and um, from using exactly the same data, but I've cut out all of the values, maximum values, um, above a thousand. And if I draw that graph again, which draws itself again, you can see things are far more spread out. 
than they were before. It's still bunched at the bottom. But what, what I found interesting was at this line here, just below 800, there's very clearly a, a, almost a straight line drawn across, say, for an awful lot of an unusual amount, if you like, of um, entries which all appear to have that same value. And if you go down and look at the table, you can see for some reason there is quite a range of records. So these are the, the daily maximum values for these households on the left. And not only do are there so many which have that same maximum value, there's quite a few which seem to have the same minimum and average value as well. So I think that would be worthy of further um, investigation before you, you delve into any serious analysis. That is the end of, of the demonstration, and it is, in fact, the end of the webinar. So in, in summary, what have we got? We, we may have no choice in using big data, um, especially if you don't control the source. Um, if you're getting it from somewhere else, if they've got it for their purposes, you've got to use it as it is, and you've got to be prepared to um, slice and dice, as we say, the, the, the data set so as to reduce it in size. Um, Always remember that, that um, Hadoop and the big data tools that you find inside Hadoop, like Hive, they're just that. They're just tools for you to use to manipulate the data in, as you need to do. Because in a lot of the cases, all you really want to do is cut it down to size so you can take it out of um, the Hadoop system back into your desktop where you're probably going to be a lot more comfortable in doing the analysis and so on and so forth. Um, we've demonstrated it, um, the desktop using R and Excel, but of course SPSS or that or any of your other desktop applications will work just as well. Um, if you want more information on, on Hive or, or even Zeppelin, there are websites um, which you can go to. Um, on the websites <laughs> there are um, if you want details about the actual syntax of Hive, you can, you can get information on that. If you want to look at the basic tutorial hive, that's also available on the website. If you want to read a book, there is a book, um, an O'Reilly book called Programming Hive, which is, I think is, is, is quite a very readable book, but it actually contains an awful lot more information, more in-depth, complex information than you'd probably want to be using at the, at the moment. But there are sections on creating tables and things like that, which you might find quite useful. Any questions? So thank you again for attending. Thank you, Peter, for presenting. It was very interesting. And uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.